Okay, great. Welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to have you all here for our March Plants, Pests, and Pathogens. Um, it's great that spring is here. We know it means there's lots of pollen in the air, um, but hopefully for many of us, some rain's moving in. It's going to help clear that out. And um, we are have a great program lined up today. We look forward to Laura Barth joining us to talk about houseplants, the identification and care. She's given us an update on houseplants and just things we all need to know because it's certainly a very popular topic now. Many people are getting into horticulture and gardening through houseplants, especially um, millennials and, and younger folks. So um, great topic to have today. Then we're also excited that Joe Neal, who is our um, Extension Weed Specialist will be joining us to give a herbicide update based on some things he's seeing out there in uh, the retail market. And we will, as always, have our Be on the Lookout with Matt Bertone and Mike Munster from the Plant Disease Insect Clinic at NC State. So those will be things you'll certainly want to listen in for and be watching for later this month. And Caroline Richardson will round us out with Extension Master Gardener program announcements of course, I'm Charlotte Glenn. I'm the state coordinator for the Extension Master Gardener Program. And um, I want to start us off with just a couple of announcements before we turn it over to Laura. Um, just an update on our plants, pests, and pathogen schedule. Um, our upcoming um, topics include next month, Matt and Mike will be our featured speakers and they will take a deep dive into the pest and plant disease issues of hydrangea and crepe myrtle, two extremely popular landscape plants. So you will definitely want to be here again next month for that. Then in May, Scott Zona, who is the plant toolbox manager, will be joining us to give us tips about using the Extension Gardener plant toolbox. And our update really is about our June speaker. We didn't have that finalized with our kickoff webinar last, last month. So now we can let everybody know that in June, um, Elsa Youngstead and Hannah Levinson, both at NC State, will be joining us to talk about managing perennial stems for pollinator habitat. Um, so Elsa and Hannah and Master Gardener volunteers across the state have been involved in a, a study for the last few years looking at how um, pollinators are potentially using stems to nest, to lay their eggs, and to overwinter. And they have the results of that um, ready to share and also including recommendations on how you can manage your perennial plant stems to make them uh, more inviting and available for pollinators to use as habitat. So we're excited to get that finalized for June. And just as a reminder, we will not have a Plants, Pests and Pathogens webinar in September. We will be having Extension Master Gardener College um, here in Raleigh. So we encourage you all to join us there. We'll have more information about that coming out um, very soon. And we want to give a big thank you to everybody, all of our Extension Master Gardener volunteers and Extension professionals who support our volunteers across the state. Um, our annual report came out earlier this month. And as always, it is just so impressive to see the work and learn more about the work that is being done across the state. Um, here we just have some of the very impressive statistics, but I encourage you if you have not uh, looked at the annual report to read some of the stories that talk about more of the detail of the work that's happening all across the state. But, you know, we had over 3,900 Master Gardener volunteers last year. That's now over 4,000. We've, we've got back up to over 4,000 Master Gardener volunteers across the state. Last year, we know um, at least 665 new volunteers were trained and um, there were over 225,000 volunteer service hours reported. And we know that's underreported, so um, we know a lot more than that actually went on. But if you uh, turn that into those number of hours into the equivalent of what that would be in full-time employees, that's equivalent to 108 additional full-time employees um, added to extensions ranks across the state. Um, and if you look at the dollar value using the dollar value of volunteer time, um, which is $29.95, that's over $6.7 million uh, in value of your time. Um, so it's, and all of it's so greatly appreciated. Um, in addition to the volunteer service, we had master, our Master Gardener volunteers put in over 67,000 hours in continuing education, such as plants, 
attending plants, pests, and pathogens. And we know this is essential for maintaining your knowledge so that you can then share that um, in your community. We have over 83 extension professionals based in county centers across North Carolina, um, working directly with the Extension Master Gardener Program. And all this um, has resulted in, in at least 280,000 or almost 281,000 North Carolina residents reached with research-based information on sustainable gardening. Um, and again, we know that's underreported too. So um, just thank you to everybody for the work you're doing across the state and the difference you're making um, for the people and communities where you are. And with that, that brings us up to our guest speaker today, who I hope many of you already know. Um, Laura Barth is an extension assistant at NC State here in the Department of Horticultural Science. She teaches the Extension Gardener online classes. This includes both the garden and landscape series and the plant ID classes that are taught in partnership with Longwood Gardens. Um, I hope many of you have taken some of those courses and if not, it might be something you wanna consider uh, in the coming months. Um, Laura also serves as the Digital Communications Director for the International Plant Propagator Society for the Southern region of North, North America, and as the Research Coordinator for the American Floral Endowment. She received both her undergraduate and master's degrees in horticulture from NC State and has a passion for horticulture and plant ID, so she is definitely in the right place. In addition to teaching the online plant ID classes, Laura has also taught plant ID to undergraduate students at NC State and Virginia Tech. So Laura, we're so happy to have you here with us today to talk about houseplant identification and care. With that, I'll stop my share and turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, let me pull this up. All right, can everybody see my presentation and hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so like Charlotte said, I'm Laura Barth, an extension assistant with um, the uh, NC uh, Extension Gardener online learning program. And I'm very excited to be here today with everyone. Um, I have a lot of information for you guys. So I will try to um, cram it all in um, as effectively as possible, but please know that I'm always available if you have any questions. So a little bit about me, uh, Charlotte already gave me a great introduction. Um, she's, uh, as she said, I got my bachelor's and master's in horticultural science from NC State. I also wanna point out um, since this is a plants, pests, and pathogens webinar, that I worked at the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic um, as an undergrad, which was really great uh, experience. And like Charlotte said, I love plant ID. Um, it is hands down my favorite subject to teach. It was my favorite subject as a student. And this is because plant ID really changes the way you see the world around you. Um, you know, it really makes the landscape become more alive. You go outside and what used to be just kind of nondescript masses of green or kind of undistinguishable conifers suddenly become, you know, their own species. They have their own textures. Um, it just, you, you see the world a, a lot differently um, and it just makes, um, gives you a greater connection to nature. So we're talking about houseplants today. Um, and other than changing the world, how you see the world outside, like what does this really have to do with houseplants? Why are plant ID and taxonomy important, um, especially when it comes to houseplants? Well, one is that understanding botanical language is so important for communication, just in terms of consistency and precision. You know, say if you're a master gardener and you're talking to somebody or maybe you are trying to figure out, you know, what a certain plant you have is, and you go to the plant toolbox and you see some words and you don't know what they mean, um, or you're just, you know, talking to other plant lovers, just being on the same page in terms of vocabulary and language makes understanding plants and communicating about plants so much easier. Um, that also ties into efficiency and time saving. If you're trying to learn more about a particular plant, you know, those words are familiar. You're not afraid to use them. You're not, you know, Googling, hey, what does this word mean? 
it's also fun. I feel like we don't necessarily stress um, how much fun just learning about plants can be. Uh, I think it's just an enjoyable thing to, to learn how to ID plants, to learn how to figure out what plants are. Um, and it helps you, um, you know, find important information quicker. Um, and I wanted to make a note at the bottom about apps. There are a lot of great plant apps um, out there that will help you ID plants, um, but you still need your own ID skills to help you confirm their results because the apps aren't gonna give you, you know, the correct answer all of the time, or they might give you several different plants that all look pretty close. And then you kind of have to decide which one it is. And then lastly, here is my number one reason why plant ID is so important for house plants. It is because the tags they put on these things are so useless, <laughs> honestly, most of the time. It's so bad people make memes about it. Um, I love memes. You'll see memes throughout this presentation. But you can see here the one on the left says, when you check the plant tag for an ID and it says tropical house plant, and then he says, thanks for nothing. And then the one on the right is similar to many tags I've seen, you know, at my local garden center or my grocery store. When I look at a plant, I don't know. And I'm like, oh, what is this? And the tag, all it says is something like this one, which says, hi there, friends call me beautiful home decor. My full name is house plant. Not exactly super helpful. So I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. Um, if you have any questions about any of this, um, I can direct you to some longer presentations that I've done, or you can take one of our classes. Um, but just briefly, taxonomy and nomenclature. Taxonomy is the scientific study of naming, defining, and classifying groups of biological organisms based on shared characteristics. And classification is fitting plants into the basic seven-tier hierarchical system developed by Linnaeus, um, which will probably become more familiar to some of you in the next slide. And nomenclature is simply designating the plant with its correct scientific name. So here is that seven-tiered hierarchical system. Um, we don't you know an ID, we typically don't deal with the um, top four. We usually um, broadly start at family. And now the family name isn't always, you know, super important for ID or you might not see it on a tag, but it can give you important clues um, if you are IDing an unknown plant. So one major example in the houseplant world is the aeroid family. Um, so if you're looking at a family name, it typically ends in the suffix A-C-E. So the aeroid family is the Aeraceae family, as you can see there. And typically, um, plants in the same family will have some shared characteristics, um, some more obvious than others. Fortunately, the Aeraceae family has some very um, distinct characteristics, especially when it comes to house plants that will help you. Um, one of them being this really distinct inflorescence or flower, which is called a uh, spathe and spadix. So here are some pictures of some plants that I'm sure you guys all know. There's Jack in the pulpit, not a house plant, but still um, something you'll be seeing in the woods pretty soon. Um, and some of you are familiar with, I'm sure. And we have our monstera, deliciosa, the Swiss cheese plant. It doesn't always flower, but when it does, it has that distinct spathe and spadix inflorescence there, which gives you a clue as to what family it's in. There is your anthurium and your peace lily. So even if you didn't know what those were, the second you saw that flower, you could be like, hmm, that is in the Aeraceae family and already you've narrowed down your search. And also probably some of your um, cultural characteristics and care, because a lot of these are um, the house plants especially are maybe a little bit more tropical. Next, we have the genus. And this is one that you'll see all the time in plant ID. And so I'm gonna do an example with oaks here just to kind of make a point, but the, the principle applies to, to all plants. So the genus is the first 
Um, the full scientific name is a binomial. The genus is the first part and it will be capitalized and in italics. And so we have Quercus, which is the genus for oaks. So you see just that one name, capital letter, um, italicized, that is your oak genus. And so plants within the same genus also have similar traits as you would imagine. Then we come down to species to get the rest of that scientific name. So the species is composed of the genus and then the specific epithets. So that's that binomial I mentioned. That's two words. And you need to say both names for the whole species. And um, the, the specific epithet is not only, um, you know, obviously useful for identifying the species, but it's essentially a Latin adjective most of the time. So it can give you context clues about, um, you know, the plant's maybe native habitat or, you know, characteristic of the flower or the foliage or things like that, which can be useful and also fun, like I said earlier. So the example before we had Quercus, which was oak. If we add that specific epithet on there, now we have Quercus virginiana, the live oak. And with that specific epithet, Virginiana, um, you kind of know that that plant maybe is from the Virginia region, maybe not necessarily Virginia, but that might be where it was um, first found. So that just kind of gives you some clues. And that image there is um, a grove of live oaks when I was uh, living in, in Norfolk, Virginia. And so here's just a really quick example of how you can um, understand you know, maybe what the plant looks like based on just knowing that scientific name. So here we have Hydrangea quercifolia. And now that you know the genus of oaks is Quercus, when you see that specific epithet there, quercifolia, you can infer that this Hydrangea has leaves, foliage, that resemble an oak, Quercus, quercifolia. So I should note that scientific names, um, you know, are incredibly consistent. And that's, you know, if you want to really, you know, have the, the greatest understanding or consistency when talking to somebody else, uh, using the scientific name is great. But they do change sometimes. Um, you know, sometimes they get reclassified. Um, and so here's a meme. It's one of my favorites. Um, I'm sure some of you know that uh, the, the scientific name of Salvia or not salvia, rosemary recently changed. And so this meme is, um, it says, does he bite? And looking at this dog and he goes, no, but he can hurt you in other ways. And the dog says, rosemarinus officinalis is now known as salvia rosemarinus. And then the other guy is crying. Um, some scientific name changes hurt more than others, especially if you get really um, attached to one or use it all the time. But despite those changes, using the scientific names is still the most uh, consistent way to talk about plants. So knowing that, now we need to talk about the common name. So in our previous example, Quercus virginiana, this is the scientific name for the live oak. The live oak is the common name. And so like I was saying, common names are not universal. Live oak is pretty universal, um, but other plants maybe not so much. Common names can vary by region. Um, I know there's a plant called Calicanthus. I'm sure many of you know it. Um, I know it as Carolina Allspice, I believe is the name I learned it as. But in Ash County, where I'm living now, they call it a bubby bush. I didn't know what that was at first. Um, so, you know, create some confusion there. Um, and sometimes different plants all have the can have the same common name. And the plants might not even be related to each other. Uh, one house plant example, you know, that kind of shows the importance of knowing the scientific name versus the common name is this one. So we have two succulents here. Um, both I've seen both called hens and chicks, um, but they are two different species. On the left, you have Echeveria. On the right, you have Semper vivum. And sure, you might figure it out at some point, um, you know, they do look a little bit different, but they have very different hardiness zones. So if you were talking to somebody and they said, 
oh yeah, sure. You can plant hens and chicks in Ash County in zone six. And you're like, awesome. And then you go to the store and you see hens and chicks on the label and you grab the plant on the left and you plant it outside. It will die. And then you will wonder why it died. And it's because that hens and chicks is not hardy. The one on the right is. And so the common name was not helpful in, um, you know, helping you understand what you could grow, what plant it was, what its care actually is. Another thing you'll see a lot, especially in house plants, is cultivar. So this is a cultivated variety, cultivar, and it's indicated by a capital capitalized name in single quotes after the scientific name. So you can see here in this example, Eupatorium dubium, that's your species name. So if you were going to go in the plant toolbox, you would type that in. And then the cultivar name is Little Joe. And the significance of a cultivar is that it has been bred, been bred and selected by humans for desirable traits. So they could have a, a shorter habit, increased flowering time. They might have a different type of flower than the species. Um, a lot of houseplants have been cultivated or have been bred. Cultivars have been created to make them more attractive in the home. So that's just important to know what you're getting there. And then there are also hybrids. You'll see these a lot in succulents. Um, they're designated technically um, with the multiplication sign, either in front of the name or in between. You're probably not gonna see that a lot on houseplant tags, so I'm not gonna linger on this point. Um, but you may see it as just the genus name followed by a cultivar name it might not even be in single quotes, but usually if it's just a genus name with another common name or a cultivar name after it, there's a good chance it's probably a hybrid. So, okay, we learned about classification um, and, you know, the, the family, genus, species. Um, so, great. How do we figure out how to classify plants into that system? How do we, you know, figure that out? And so this is where ID comes in. And so we identify characters, which are the morphological or recognizable features of the plants. The most simple way to do this, um, very helpful in house plants because they a lot of times have very distinct forms depending on what you're buying, is just, you know, narrowing it down by type and form. So, you know, there's probably only a few different house plants that could be classified as a tree or a shrub. A lot of them are herbaceous. You know, there's some that are vines. You have a lot of succulents, cacti, maybe conifers, like a um the, those little ones that you get at Christmas time, a Norway, Norway pine, I think that is. Um sometimes, and this isn't usually these aren't usually types that I um, break out in my normal plant ID talk, but it is a little different for house plants. Sometimes you might just see them, you know, as as foliage. It's listed as foliage, um, or it might be a flowering house plant. Or sometimes they're just listed as tropical. Um, so you can probably infer some of those characteristics just by looking at them, or that's how you'll kind of see it if you go to the plant toolbox or your apps or whatever you're using. Of course, we are dealing with biological organisms which don't always like to play by our human rules and fit nicely into our little boxes. Um, this is a plant that I think is sometimes a house plant, maybe grown as an outdoor plant, is Pereschia. And here, you know, it looks like your regular tree or shrub. But you zoom in and you look at those leaves. Oh, it's also a cactus. So that's cool because that actually helps you narrow down your ID even further. So you have like a tree, that's a cactus. And so you'll probably, you know, just by understanding the different types and kind of narrowing it down, you've already probably figured out what this is. Next we have form. Um, so that's just kind of the habit of how the plant grows. Um, so you have mounding or maybe weeping uh, like this plant over here, it might be erect or upright. Maybe it's very narrow. You would call that columnar. 
It could just be open or spreading, um, multi-stemmed. Uh, basil rosette is another one that kind of falls under leaf morphology, but could also, you know, maybe be listed as a form. And that's when the leaves all kind of rise out of a ring at the bottom there, like this streptocarpus. streptocarpus. Um, and then here too, so you see that this is a cactus, but it's also weeping. So you have your type, which is the cactus, you have your form weeping, and you've probably already, you know, narrowed it down enough to, to be able to classify this plant and get its name. Leaf morphology is super important. Um, and that includes leaf arrangement, leaf type, leaf shape, and leaf venation, which I'll go over here. This is usually more for deciduous trees, uh, the leaf arrangement. You'll maybe see it sometimes on houseplants, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, but I think you have access to these slides if you want to review this, or I can share some of this info with you. Leaf type can be very important. So we have simple leaves, which are just one uninterrupted blade. You see this little leaf stalk. That's called the petiole. If you look at this, there's just one blade. It can be lobed or have different shapes, but you can still see it's uninterrupted once you go past that petiole. And so those are simple leaves. Compound leaves are leaves that after the bud, so you see the bud on the plant, then you see the petiole, there are what are called leaflets. So you can see here in this example um, of a trifoliate leaf, trifoliate meaning you three leaflets. And you can see that after the petiole, there are these three leaflets and this whole thing is the leaf. And then that, you know, they can be divided further and further. You have pinnate, you can see this is the petiole, the bud would be right here. This whole thing is the leaf. Bipinnate, palmate, but you can see that individual leaflets versus the uninterrupted leaf blade. So that's something you'll see um, in houseplants. Just to kind of reiterate that, a simple leaf, everything beyond the bud is one leaf. So you have your simple leaf and your compound leaf. Again, this doesn't really apply to herbaceous plants or cacti, um, but for some of your more shrubby or tree-like house plants, this, will, this can be an important ID character. So just some other leaf morphology terms that you'll commonly see for house plants, like a sheathing leaf, that's a leaf in which the petiole and or base surrounds the stem for an extended length, like a tube. A basil rosette, that's like your African violet. All the leaves just come out of the ground, simple leaves coming out of the ground and a kind of a ring and then the flowers stick out above that. Um, acolescent, that's without a stem. So things like Sansevieria where the leaves are coming right up out of the ground. Um, and then there's one of my favorite memes, a uh, new philodendron leaf. Because if you've grown a philodendron, you know they kind of have that um, sheathing or clasping leaf and then the new leaf kind of just pops out of it like the uh like a shoe that's too small leaf shape is a huge one this one will probably be more important for you overall than leaf arrangement in terms of identifying house plants um and i'm going to share a book with you at the end of the webinar that'll give you some information about um, leaf shape and things like that because i don't need to spend um all this time going over what the different shapes are, or I mean, I would love to, I don't have the time to. So here's just kind of an overview of some of the different shapes you'll see um, on plants. Sagittate, that's a common one for some of our house plants like philodendrons or some of the aeroids. And then we can narrow it down even further. So leaf bases have their own set of terms. Like auriculate is one you'll see probably a lot, or sagittate. Leaf tops, the apices, also have their own terms, um, which are also very useful in helping you narrow down your ID. 
Leaf margins, another big one. Um, sometimes plants look so similar and the differentiating feature is simply what the margin looks like. Leaf venation is also interesting. Um, it's just the pattern of the leaves or the, the veins on the leaves. Um, it's not always like a key ID trait, but it can be really helpful in terms of narrowing down uh, mere species that you're looking at. Floral mor morphology is another big one, especially for our flowering house plants. Um, flowers are frequently the easiest way to ID things. Um, if you there's no flower on it, that's when you get into the leaf ID. Um, so if you have a flower, that's awesome because that will really help you. So there are four parts of a flower, uh, the sepal, petal, or four, four whorls. Um, and then the, the sepal, the petal, and those are the protective organs. And then we have the stamen and the pistil, which are the male and female reproductive organs. And so here's kind of just a little example of that. Um, you can see the sepals are down here below. There are these, the green part, the petal right here. We're all familiar with that. The stamens, which have the pollen on the anthers. Now y'all are enjoying all that pollen right now. Um, and then we have the, the, the pistil, and then that'll be the ovary and develop the seeds. So there are different types of flowers which can help with your ID. There are complete flowers, which is a flower containing all four of those whorls that we talked about, the sepals, petals, stamens, and pistils. And then we have incomplete flowers, which is our flowers that are missing one or more of those whorls. Then we have perfect flowers. And so that's a flower containing both stamens and pistils, and it can be complete or incomplete. Um, and then we have imperfect flowers, which is a flower missing either stamens or pistils. So it has flowers that are staminate only, which means they only contain stamens, or they are pistillate, which means they only contain pistils. Floral symmetry is a really key ID feature for some of our flowering house plants. Uh, we have actinomorphic symmetry, which is radial symmetry in which more than one line of symmetry exists in the shape of the flower. So I like to think of that as if you fold it in half in basically any direction, it's going to match up nicely. The other type of floral symmetry is zygomorphic. And that is bilateral symmetry in which only one line of symmetry exists. So you are only able to fold it on in half in one section in order to get it to line up nicely. And so here is a meme that really illustrates this nicely, I think. So on the left, you have your zygomorphic flower. On the right, your actinomorphic. And you can see there on the left, you just are only able to fold it in half that once and have it line up on the right. When he's just kind of a cylinder there, when he's shaking, you can fold it in any direction. Okay, so now we're gonna get into a little bit of houseplant care. Um, and before I get into this, I think it's important to note that just like, you know, in our gardens outside, a lot of what we're doing for houseplant care is essentially an effort to mimic um, the plant's native conditions. Um, some plants are more tolerant than others, um, but um, you know some are really particular. Especially you know some of the succulents or maybe some of the more rare house plants. They really need um, certain certain um, cultural characteristics or real have specific needs. So first let's talk about light. Um, some plants require low light, which is, you know, they can tolerate more than eight feet from a window or close to a north light. Um, like our cast iron plant is a good one for that. Um, I found uh, Sansevieria, a uh, snake plant to be very tolerant. Um, medium light, so that's four to eight feet from south and east windows and no direct sun. 
And then we have plants that need high light. So this is going to be a lot of our succulents and cacti and maybe some of our um, our other other flowering house plants. Um, a lot of plants like orchids or flowering house plants need a little bit more light to create those blooms. And so that's highlight within four feet of south, east, or west facing windows. And so if you go on uh, particularly the plant toolbox or if you have um, any sort of house plant book, will give you the lighting requirements uh, for your plants. And I also wanna say that sometimes uh, supplemental lighting is absolutely needed, especially for succulents. And I have learned this the hard way. Um, sometimes just having it in a bright window is not enough. And so a lot of times you'll you know go into a coffee shop or sometimes you know my plants look like this where it looks really, really stretched out the, the space in between the leaves is called a node. You can see we have these really long, or it's called an internode, where the leaves are as a node. You have these really long internodes. So that is a telltale sign that the plant is not getting enough light. Or if you see like flowers, um, you know, maybe starting or aborting or they don't start at all. So there are a number of different lights available on the market from you know, just little inexpensive clip on things to a full blown like grow light that you would see, you know, in a horticultural facility and a commercial facility. Um, LEDs are usually the most economical and you, like I said, you can get them in a wide range of sizes. Um, I have one, I have a succulent collection. I think I got mine for maybe 100 or 200, which is a little expensive. Um, but it was absolutely necessary for me in order to get the nice growth and coloration that I wanted. Um, I didn't, I, I neglected to mention that the, the colors, especially for some of your succulents, are truly dependent on light. Um, so they might just be more kind of green and flat and boring. And then you pop them under a grow light, or if you're able to put them outside in the sun, then you really see those colors pop. Typically, you want to position your grow light about a foot higher than the plants. Um, but I found this is something that I need to experiment with. And it also depends on the um, power of your light. The light I bought was um, quite powerful. And so I had a little bit too close and it was actually scorching the leaves. And I could see the plants kind of, some of the succulents will like retreat into the soil like they would in their natural desert habitat. And my plants were kind of starting to bury themselves. And so I knew I had to... Um, raise my light a little bit in order to get the, uh, the the results I was looking for. And one thing you absolutely should do if you're growing under a grow light, especially one of the bigger ones, is you need to um, get your plants used to that light. So don't, don't, don't just pop them in for 12 hours immediately. Uh, you want to um, get them used to it by putting them in, you know, start out small and then increase the the intervals that you have them under those lights each day so they don't get shock and also so they don't get leaf burn. They will definitely burn, especially if they have been in a really shady environment. Humidity is a key factor for a lot of our foliage houseplants. So think your Swiss cheese plant, your philodendrons, orchids especially. Oh, orchids. I have had some issues with humidity with my orchids. Uh, most of our Plants like this prefer at least 55 to 60% humidity. Um, unfortunately, most homes and offices have about 10 to 15% humidity. So as you can imagine, uh, that causes some problems. Uh, some of the issues you might see if you don't have enough humidity are yellow leaves, dropped blooms. Oh, especially on the orchids. Um, my orchid, I have this orchid. I've had it since um, I was in grad school and it starts to put out blooms, but I consistently usually have two or three, maybe even more abort because I just have a difficult time, especially in the winter here in the south, um, in the mountains, especially the heater comes on, it dries out everything in the house. Um, and so that's that's really hard to do, even with consistent misting. So some ways to overcome humidity issues are to group plants together. Um, one way that I've found I don't have listed here is to kind of create like a, a grow case. You can have create a tent. I have friends who do carnivorous plants and they have these grow tents set up or maybe it's like an aquarium. Um, there are ways to do it that are attractive. It doesn't just have to be this ugly box sitting in your house. 
um, with like a mist system where you're spraying it. Um, sometimes you can use um, a Rubbermaid. It's not the most attractive um, way to do it, but sometimes if I just need to, you know, go away on a trip or I'm storing these plants because I'm, I'm still kind of, you know, I recently moved, so I'm rearranging them, but I need them to maintain their humidity. I'll put them in a clear Rubbermaid and just mist it every now and then, and then they stay nice until I can kind of put them in their final homes. You can also keep them in a kitchen um, or a bathroom, um, making sure they have the right light requirements because those are typically more humid places, um, a laundry room. And frequently just misting, have a mist bottle or a kettle. Maybe you could have a cloche on some of them, which is like a, a dome you put over the top of it. Um, I know that here at my house, I always have my mist bottle handy. I don't always uh, remember to do it. Um, but those of you out there who are maybe slightly better plant parents than me, you know, will regularly mist your plants and that helps a lot. Water. You would think water would be easy, but it's not always. Um, it can be surprisingly difficult. Some plants have what we call Goldilocks syndrome, where it's just never, never right. And so many houseplants die because they don't get enough water. Conversely, many houseplants die because they get too much water. I tend to fall on the underwatering. Um, some people I know tend to fall on the overwatering. They just love their plants to death and they just water them all the time because it's fun and they like interacting with them. Um, so, so I think in your watering regime, kind of understanding your watering characteristics and maybe what plants suit your innate tendencies, um, you know, knowing that I tend to easily forget to water or be distracted, I lean towards more succulents or drought tolerant plants, um, cause I might just forget to mist my, uh, monstera and then that would just be sad. So proper watering, there are techniques to watering. One of the first things you learn in greenhouse cultivation is how to properly water a plant. So you wanna water thoroughly so that all the soil is moist. If you have a saucer under there, you want to discard the extra water um, cause salts can build up. One technique to see if your plant needs water is called you know, just the finger probe. If you stick your finger about an inch under the soil and it's dry, then it's time to water. One really easy characteristic is just feel your plants when they're wet, after you've watered them, get a sense of that weight. And then when you pick them up later and they're lighter, that means it's dry and it's time to water again. Um, do know that you could have some issues based on your water source. So if you're on city water, you could have fluoride. Um, you know, for some plants that are uh, fussier about water, uh, you could take your tap water and then you just let it sit out overnight and some of those things will dissolve out. Um, for carnivorous plants especially, you would want to do that. Um, and water temperature, uh, room temperature water is best. You don't want to go too cold or too hot. It could shock or damage the, uh, the delicate roots of some of those plants. So I think I'm getting a little close on time. Um, so just troubleshooting watering. Here are some issues that you might see. The plant has, um, you know, there are some ways you can tell um, if your plant needs water or if you're having some issues. One thing you will commonly come across, especially if you're using older media, is that your soil becomes hydrophobic. Peat moss is a naturally hydrophobic substance. Um, and you can see here that some of those parts aren't watering or aren't absorbing the water, you know, after pouring it on top. One way to overcome this is to soak your plant, to, um, to bottom water it. You put it in a tray of water and let it sit there. And then those parts will kind of just reabsorb the water. Um, I prefer to bottom water anyway, typically. I feel like you get more even distribution of the water. And sometimes when you're watering from the top, it can just maybe um, splash out some of that soil. Oops, I don't know why we have two humidity slides there. Containers are so important. My biggest takeaways for you for containers, it needs to have drainage holes, especially with your houseplants. So many of them will come in these little containers that don't have drainage holes. They look cute, or they might have a pot in the little decorative container. And the pot itself has drainage holes, but then it drains into this thing without drainage holes. And then the water sits there and becomes stagnant. 
and then you might um, that might lead to overwatering, anaerobic conditions, fungal pathogens, fungus gnats, all kinds of nasty things. So you always want to make sure that there are drainage holes, or if you absolutely need to use that Q container, make sure you drain the water out afterwards. The material of your container will make a huge difference. Um, porous materials like clay. Well, the water will evaporate much faster and you'll need to water more frequently or else it might help you um, not overwater, especially with succulents. I like to use uh, ceramic containers for um, a lot of my succulents. Semi-porous are your wood and your pressed fiber. And then non-porous, which means that the water won't evaporate as quickly are your plastic containers, metal, glazed ceramic. You'll see a lot of ceramic containers in houseplants. Potting media is really important. You don't want to use your soil from the garden. You want to um, use a potting mix that has better drainage. Your garden soil will kill roots. It might have pathogens in it. Um, so you want to just go and get a potting mix, usually from the store, but you can make it mix it yourself as well. And the reason potting mixes are so successful is because they are Usually they have all of these good qualities that I have listed here. So they have large particles, which allows for aeration and water drainage. They have the right amount of small particles, which are important for the water holding capacity and nutrient holding capacity. And they're also lightweight. They are typically, you know, sterile. They don't have weed seeds in them. And a lot of them do have like a starter fertilizer charge. So here's just a list of some of your common media components. If you're just starting out with houseplants or succulents, you can buy pre-made mixes, and I recommend those. A lot of them are very good. Um, I worked in horticultural substrates. We trialed a lot of them. I can say um, confidently that a lot of them will, will be perfect for you. Um, you can get into mixing your own, which can be fun, um, especially for your suc succulents or your cacti. Um, you can you can get pumice, you can get some other things, and you can experiment with making your own. Um, but succulent and cacti mixes are available to buy as well. Um, but for most of your house plants, you know, especially your foliage or your flowering house plants, your general potting mix will will be good enough. Um, there are lots of different brands available. They commonly have the same things in them. So a mix of peat moss, perlite, vermiculite. They are easy to find. You can get them at your local garden center. You'll want to look that, make sure that it says potting mix on it. They usually have it very clearly labeled. And you don't want to get the bag that says topsoil, um, potting soil, garden soil, et cetera, because that's not going to be quite right for your house plants. And like I said, they do contain fertilizers. Uh, we call it like a starter charge. Um, you know, but if you aren't repotting right away, it's going to be in that soil for a little bit of time, you probably will need to add more fertilizers. And those are something too, you don't have to get super fancy with them. A lot of times you can just even go to the grocery store, they'll have a little fertilizer for houseplants in a bottle, you can just squirt it out or you can pour it, it's really convenient. Um, I recommend those a lot. So some common pests and diseases of houseplants are fungal leaf spots um, from wet foliage. If you're watering them a lot, another reason I like bottom watering is because you kind of avoid getting the water on the leaves. Um, fungal root rots from soggy or overwatered soil. This can be a drainage issue, and this could be an overwatering issue. Um, this could also be a function of temperature. I haven't talked about temperature a lot, but if you're watering heavily and it's colder conditions, you're probably more likely to just have that consistently overwatered soil. Um, you know, one sign that you're having some root diseases um, is if your plants are wilty like this, even though you've watered them a lot. You can get bacterial foliar, foliar disease from high humidity, high temperatures, crowding, and poor air circulation. So there is a balance here. You have to, and I can't make specific recommendations because it will vary by the number of plants you have and your growing conditions. But like I mentioned earlier, there's a balance between keeping the humidity up, but also making sure you still have that aeration and air circulation to avoid some of these problems. And if you are experiencing some of these diseases, we typically re recommend that you throw uh, the plants away just so you don't spread that stuff to some of your other plants. 
common insect pests. Um, aphids, I think I've experienced all of these in my houseplant journey. So aphids along with honeydew uh, can be a big problem. Soft scales, mealybugs, thrips, uh, which can cause some, some leaf damage. They all can. Spider mites, um, fungus gnats. Home treatments can be effective. So you could use, um, some people use like vinegar treatments or a soapy wash, um, neem oil. I think you can probably get some sort of insecticide sprays for these. I don't know that that's something you would want to do. I personally try to avoid those. Um, sometimes too, just simply moving the plant, if it can tolerate it, that is, but just moving it outside has helped me with some of the pest and disease issues. I had really bad mealy bugs and for some reason, um, just putting the plant more outside. I think it was honestly happier out there if the plant is undergoing poor growing conditions, like maybe not enough light or not the right temperature, they are more susceptible to these pests. So I think by moving some of my plants outside in the summer, they were happier overall, they were growing faster, they were kind of able to um, outgrow some of these pests. There is some houseplant maintenance you can do. Um, so you can, you know, it's important to dust your plants. You can use a damp cloth or feather duster. Some people like to give their plants a little shower, to just clean those leaves off. Um, it can help kind of with the plant photosynthesizing and respiring. Turning plants is really important, especially if you only have a light source from one direction. You know, the plant will kind of get uneven growth or it might grow towards that light and not be straight. So you wanna rotate it regularly to kind of promote nice, even growth. You can trim off any uh, tips or margins that maybe are starting to die back. And then just removing yellow or discolored foliage and spent blooms. Repotting is another important one, one that I think probably many of us put off. Um, it's always fun when I get into it, but I always kind of dread it. And signs your plant needs to be repotted are if the lower leaves are turning yellow, the plants start growing smaller leaves, um, the plant is wilting between watering, it's wilting quicker, you notice that it's wilting more often. If you see roots appearing through the drainage holes, um, if you hold the pot upside down and that the root ball slides out really easy and you can maybe even see that the plant is root bound, that's a sign you need to repot it. Um, so when you are repotting a plant, you wanna do the one third to two third rule, which means that the plant should not be larger than two thirds the size of the pot and no smaller than one thirds. You really don't want that pot to be too big. So no more than two inches in diameter. You can see there that that pot there is way too large. Uh, you just don't want all that extra soil sitting in there. And you wanna plant it at the same level as before. Um, and then you also wanna sterilize the new container before repotting. All right, so some resources I have for you are the Extension Gardener Handbook, Chapter 18, um, Plants Grown in Containers. Um, the Extension Gardener Handbook, I recommend the whole thing as a resource, especially for some of the botany, but Chapter 18 has some really good information uh, that covers everything we've talked about today for houseplants. One book I really like, it was originally given to me as a joke, um, but I actually, it's a really good book and my, uh, some of my colleagues from Longwood Gardens like it as well is the How Not to Kill Your Houseplant book by Veronica Peerless. Um, it just has really good information for the major types of houseplants. And then also for plant ID and just general plant information, the plant toolbox, I'm sure many of you are already aware of it, but definitely, um, there's so much good information in there, especially about any, any houseplant that you want to know is probably in there. Um, and then if you're interested in plant ID resources, I recommend plant identification and terminology, an illustrated glossary, and then also the visual dictionary of plants. This one is out of print, but you can get it used for like two bucks on Amazon. We also have some classes coming up. We have uh, houseplant succulents and cacti, which is a self-study class, meaning that you have, it's entirely self-paced and asynchronous and you have access to the materials for one year from the time of enrollment. Understanding plants is currently underway, but it's not too late to join. Uh, this one is instructor led, so you will get feedback from me, um, an interaction with other students, but it's still um, asynchronous within uh, the time frame. And then we also have the Gardens, Lawns and Landscapes five course series, which is just some really good 
general information about gardening, containers, basically everything you want to know uh, to be an effective uh, grower of plants you will find in these classes. And so you can enroll for one class and you can enroll for the entire series if you want to, there are options. And so you can see the full schedule at the website I have there. And you can also just email me if you want to. And so that is it. Um, thank you again for having me. It's been great to be here and I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. Thank you so much, Laura. That was just wonderful. Um, appreciate you sharing all of that in the amount of time that we had. And um, I know people would love to have your slides later on, if that's possible. Definitely. Uh, thanks also for those resources. Um, people are asking a couple of things. Um, we've given uh, given everybody an access to the fact sheet for fungus naps, how to handle those indoors. We have an NC State fact sheet, so we included that link. And um, folks are also just talking about name changes. Sansevieria, I think, has been changed to Dracaena. Is that true? It has. Oh, boy. It has. <laughs> That's another one that hurt. Like that. I know, I know. <laughs> it's like, once you learn this stuff, please don't change it. Once we, it's hard enough to learn it the first time around, right? Yep. I know. And then sometimes even worse, they go back and then you're like, oh, I learned yeah. this name for nothing. Right. I know it. Um, one question is coming in about the houseplant succulents and cacti course. How many hours is the course? Um, um, so that varies. We have a, a link. Let me see if I can find the link and put it in the chat. That talks about how long these the courses might take someone. Yeah. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. And is, are you ask, is, are they asking from the perspective of like, um, I think this question, it talks about like master gardener continuing education hours. Um, um, but it, perhaps. it still has a, a breakdown of how you okay. can keep track of the hours. I'm going to post that. In the that'd chat. be great. Thank you. All right. Well, while Laura's doing that, Charlotte, you want to jump in and um, take it from here? Absolutely. So thank you so much, Laura. You shared so many wonderful tips. Um, I and and I was just laughing several times at the memes and various things you shared at the beginning. But one thing, um, you know, I just want to say how fortunate we are to have you here at NC State and part of the Extension Gardener team. Um, and with the beginning, when you talked about houseplants and how the labeling is so poor, um, it really kind of connects to what uh, Joe Neal is going to talk to us about, but he's going to be talking about related to herbicide products. So, so much of what's available out there in the consumer market. Um, yeah, the labeling's really poor. You don't know actually what you're getting. Um, and that's where it's really important that we are giving people the right information and, um, and advising them on what to look for and what to know. Um, so thanks again, Laura. And with that, I'm really happy to pass it over to Dr. Joe Neal, who is our Professor of Weed Science and Extension Specialist. He's going to give us a brief update on um, what's out there on the market for herbicides available to homeowners, uh, homeowners, especially some things you need to know and be aware of. Um, and this is just a little teaser because we actually have Joe Neal joining us again on July 11th. Um, to talk about landscape weed ID and management. And Caroline will be sharing a, a, a announcement about that later on as we wrap up today. But that's definitely a date you want to put on your calendar. That's just gonna be a continuing education webinar outside of plants, pests and pathogens. So with that, Joe, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Charlotte. Uh, so before I share my screen, I I want to say this is going to be a really brief uh, update just to raise your awareness of, of something that uh, I've seen, you know, it, occupational hazard. I went to the Home Depot to, uh, to get something for my mower and, you know, I have to look at the aisle for all the herbicides are just to see what is on the shelf. And quite frankly, it shocked me. Um, and and I'm just going to I'm going to share uh, show you just a few slides of some um, some images that I, uh, you know, that I saw. And um, it's basically, you know, 
we've been been dealing with this issue that you know a trade name what we think of as a trade name doesn't mean the same thing it used to mean so when you tell somebody or talk about oh you know uh, spray spray those weeds with roundup what what are we really talking about now most of us who have been in this field for a while you know immediately think oh we're going to spray some glyphosate you know and so and you can find bottles labeled roundup that contain glyphosate but not at home depot uh, they contain everything but glyphosate. Uh, I did find, I did a quick search online for uh, what, you know, what I could find. So Roundup uh, ready to use, weed and grass killer containing glyphosate plus pelargonic acid. Now you can buy this online, but it was not on the shelf at the store. What was on the shelf at the store is Roundup weed and grass killer exclusive formula. That contains triclopyr plus thalazophot plus diquat. Now, triclopyr is a product that's been used in landscapes for many, many years under the trade name of poison ivy, poison oak killer, or brush killer. Uh, and it's the same active ingredient that the Department of Transportation uses to kill trees and shrubs on roadsides. All right. Now, yes, it is included in some lawn care products uh, for broadleaf weed control and lawns. Uh, but, you know, for years I've said, yes, you can use triclopyr in landscape beds. But remember, that product is designed to kill trees and shrubs. And it does have some soil residual. We demonstrated that uh, 30 years ago when it first came on the market, that uh, if you have uh, shallow rooted plants, you can get root uptake of triclopyr. So it concerns me uh, that this product uh, is now being just switched out for glyphosate, which does not typically do not have root uptake. Uh, okay, there we go. You know, and then I went a little further. Okay, so I found there's Roundup Super Concentrate weed and grass pillar. And that is a 52% concentrate of glyphosate. All right. You know, again, you won't find that on, on, the, uh, on the shelves at the box stores, but you will find it available through their websites. Uh, and then uh, you know, there are other weeding grass killers on the shelves. Bioadvanced weeding grass killer. That contains glufosinate. Okay. Now, I will stop right here for just a moment to say, if there is one product on the market that we could easily switch with glyphosate, this is the one. Not only does it sound a little like you're saying glyphosate, it is glufosinate. Okay, and it is a non-selective herbicide. You spray on the foliage. It is absorbed. It kills most plants. It's effective on most plants. But it doesn't translocate the way glyphosate does. And so perennial weeds are not going to be as well controlled. You have to come back and make applications. In particular, at Bermuda grass, uh, it will look like it's dying, but it really is not. It comes back with, you know, with vigor uh, within a few weeks. But it is a very good product uh, that is uh, widely used in water cropping systems, including around plants in nurseries. So... Like I said, if there's one product that is easily could easily be switched with glyphosate, this is the one. Um, but uh, there are other materials, spectrocyte, weed, and grass killer concentrate that contains diquat, fusillade, and banvil or dicamba. Um, again, a broadleaf uh, herbicide that is used to, uh, you know, in a lot of lawn care operations that we historically have not been enthusiastic about seeding it around ornamentals because it does have some soil residual and some root uptake potential. Uh, and then, you know, I looked at, okay, Roundup 365. Well, it used to be called Roundup 360. It's different now. But you can, if you look online, you can get Roundup Max Control 365 that contains glyphosate plus imazepine. 
if you go to the store, you're going to find up, find Roundup Dual Action 365 that contains triclopyr, fluazifop, and mazapic, and diquat. All right. And then you could also look on the other side of the aisle and find Roundup Landscape Weed Preventer for pre-emergence weed control in flower beds. And then on the other side of the aisle is Roundup for Lawns, and that contains MCPA or, or uh, plus quinclorac, plus dicamba, plus sulfentris on a broad spectrum, lawn, broadleaf, grass, and sedge control material controls these sedges, broadleaves, and crabgrass, but does not kill the uh, or damage cool season lawns uh, and uh, will damage all your ornamentals. So Roundup is, is what we call a brand now. It is a brand and, and they can put all kinds of chemicals under that brand. And Roundup is not um, unique in this way. There are lots of product lines that are brands like the ortho ground clear so you look for ortho ground clear we grass killer starts working immediately in 15 minutes that just contains pelargonic acid or sodium ammonium nonanoate which is just huh? ammonium yeah. nonanoate yeah louis ammonium nonanoate Oh, you're muted. Uh, Charlotte muted me. I guess I'm out of time. No, Joe, I'm sorry. I was trying to <laughs> mute the uh, background noise and I got, I hit the wrong. <laughs> Pardon me. No problem. Uh, and then there's a uh, ground clear super weed and grass killer. And that contains diquat, glyphosate plus dicamba. We've seen that before in the Roundup weed killer that you can buy on the shelf, right? And then there's a gr ground clear year round that contains a mazapir plus pelargonic acid. Now, if like me, if you shop around a little bit, you'll find an old jug uh, sometimes at some of the garden centers of ground clear year round vegetation killer that contains glyphosate plus a mazapir. Uh, and so honestly, it is just buyers beware. Uh, when it comes to herbicides in the uh, retail sector. Um, and, and that is really the message uh, that I have for you is that, you know, all of the, the issues regarding uh, the, you know, potential safety or, or health effects of glyphosate have led to the withdrawal of glyphosate from a lot of the retail products. Okay. And that has created a lot of disruption um, for the, uh, you know, for in this marketplace and the companies, you know, are, are coming up with alternative products to meet this market demand to, to put into this market. And, uh, you know, we, we really haven't, you know, tested these products extensively for use around in, in landscape plantings. One thing I will say is never, ever use a product containing imazapir in a landscape planting. Never use a product that contains imazapir. Uh, be much more cautious with the use of these herbicides that are alternatives to glyphosate. Okay, if it contains triclopyr or dicamba or MCPA, those are products designed for broadleaf weed control. And you know that herbicide doesn't know the difference between the broadleaf weeds and your azaleas. So you've just got to be a lot more cautious with these products because a lot of them do have root uptake potential. Um, and so this is gonna be much more uh, relevant if you are on a, a sandy soil or if you have a very old landscape bed that's had a lot of mulch over the years, then you can have a lot of surface roots growing in the decomposed mulch. And you can, that can lead to root uptake of some of these herbicides. So again, caution is the operative word when you're talking with your clients 
uh, about some landscape weed control, just tell them, read the label. Look at the active ingredients and make sure you're getting what you expect. And if you have clients that still you know, are looking for glyphosate, it is available. They're just going to have to look a lot harder for it. That's, and that's really all I, I was hoping to bring to your awareness. Now, I've, I've got to go back. If you've got also, if you have the uh, uh, slide set that I produced a few years ago on retail herbicides, uh, delete it. It's <laughs> obsolete this year. Okay. Yeah. I've got to go back and change the whole thing. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Yeah, I all think right. your message is well received in terms of buyer beware. Um and awareness that now with some of the, you know, kickback from glyphosate uh, products are, are on the market now that are alternatives to that. And, and Roundup is not just uh, equal with the glyphosate, Roundup the brand uh, that's branched out considerably and we need to really read the, read the label. Um, would you say that your, um, the herbicide fact sheet currently is a good resource still, or would you like to um look that one over um uh, i'll put it in the chat the one i'm thinking of joe yeah i'm, I'm not sure which one okay Helen is. there we go in the chat and um let me know your thoughts on on that one looks recently updated but um oh, something for people to go back to yes the the information on the uh, on the website are still uh is still valid because if you look at the commercial side of landscape management, uh, the the landscape commercial landscape managers are going to still be using glyphosate and they and all of those other products. So that chart that you're you're linking to is really just for the entire industry. What are all the products available? And and there are a lot of those products that that while legal. Uh, for homeowners to use are really inaccessible. Okay. Uh, they're really designed for and bottled and manufactured for use by professionals. And the price for the bottle is one of the limiting uh, factors. You know, so you know, not many people, are, not many homeowners are going to go out and spend six hundred and fifty dollars for you know, three pints of spectacle. You know, but right, a commercial right. operation will do so because it's a very effective herbicide. Okay. Um, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you. And I've taken some notes and I'll share those with everyone in the follow-up resources from today's webinar. Uh, but we really appreciate because it is the time that we're all walking through those stores right now and advising yeah. people as well. Great. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. And with that, Matt and Mike, I will turn it over to you for our Be On The Lookouts for the month ahead. Great. Uh, thanks, Caroline. Thanks, Joe. And uh, thanks, Laura. We, uh, we're glad to see you. And uh, we enjoyed the time you spent with us at the clinic many years ago. Feels like ages ago, of course. So thanks. And we're glad you're still around here doing cool stuff. Um, so let me talk to you about some arthropods to be on the lookout for. Um, I will admit that every year is a little different and uh, we I've actually already seen a lot of these things out but just to remind you uh, so boxwood leaf miners are out flying so if you got the new growth on your boxwoods check out these little orange gnat like things so it's flying around your plants. Uh, if you have an infestation of the boxwood leaf miners they will be emerging out of the leaves from last year's brood and uh, mating and then injecting their eggs into the new growth. So uh, those are something you want to be aware of if you have a boxwood leaf miner uh, infestation on your plants. Uh, bees and wasps are very active right now. They're going and looking for homes, uh, looking for areas to nest. The male carpenter bees with the yellow faces might be out uh, guarding territories and the females will start to mate with them soon and build the nests. Um, you may see some spring invaders in homes. Uh, so hoplia beetles, these uh, these dark hoplia with this very large single claw on the hind leg, uh, and clover mites might be invading homes. We've actually gotten a few uh, messages about these things coming inside. Um, they're typically a very uh, 
short-term nuisance. Uh, they don't cause any damage to homes or people. They're uh, not really going to be damaging plants either. They just can be abundant sometimes and sometimes enter homes. Uh, so a lot of baby critters are going to be emerging. A lot of the insects that overwinter's eggs are now popping out. They're they're uh, being born, so mantises are going to start hatching as it starts to get warmer, and you're going to get a lot of the other bugs, like the wheel bugs and the leaf-footed bugs, emerging. Uh, and they're going to be small, of course, so you may not see them at first, but um, but you may see them around if you're investigating a garden pretty well. Uh, there are going to be a few caterpillars emerging, uh, so we're going to start to maybe see some eastern tent caterpillars uh, these are these fuzzy caterpillars with the white stripe down the back, and then the ones that make the big uh, uh, silken tent in the crotches of uh, cherry trees and other rosaceous hosts, typically. Um, and there may be some other early spring uh, foliar feeding caterpillars, especially, for instance, uh, fall canker worms. Uh, the name fall canker worm coming from the adults that are active in the fall and winter, not the larvae that are these small green inchworms. Uh, that can uh, feed on the new foliage that's uh, coming out on the plants. Uh, these are identified by the two large pairs of prolegs and these little stumpy ones right in front of these uh, this first major proleg pairs. Um, if you're digging in the soil to prepare your gardens, you might find uh, turn up some insects from underground. So you might see some white grubs, things like that. Uh, in very low densities, these are not going to be an issue. They are often feeding on kind of the decaying matter and detritus. Um, they're not feeding on the plants themselves, but uh, in large quantities, they can actually eat plant roots. So if you feel like removing them, you can. You can throw them somewhere and birds will eat them. Um, but uh, you also may start seeing scales. The crawlers are going to start in some of these species soon, uh, start infesting the plants, other places. If you have a plant that's infested with scales, uh, sometimes you can uh, tell when the crawlers are going to be present by clipping a little twig of the infested material off, uh, putting it in a bag. And then uh, once the bag, uh, you start to see little tiny crawlers crawling around the bag, you know that the timing is right for treatment. And of course, there's got lots of other activity of uh, of insects and other arthropods. So you might see some termites swarming. Uh, you're going to see more cockroaches, slugs, spiders, all these things becoming more active. Um, you're also uh, it's starting to get to a point where most of the hibernating insects are out and about already, like the stink bugs and wasps. Although I did get a message about a very large hornet. Uh, somebody was afraid it was a murder hornet. Uh, it was not. It was a European hornet ha um, emerging in their house and caught between their screen and their window. So be on the lookout for these things. Of course, there's lots and lots of things out there being active. There's lots of pollinators and things are visiting the new flowers. Um, but uh, if you find anything you're not sure about, uh, just let us know and we'd be happy to identify it for you. And with that, I will turn it over to Mike. Oh, okay, there the video worked. Good morning, everyone. I see, um, that, yeah, as we all do, spring is out there. And as Matt said, when you're digging around, you can find some interesting things. I wanted to start with a little uh, a mystery photo here. I actually used it two years ago, but we will see if it uh, triggers any memories for anyone. So let's see. That would be there. Okay. So mystery photo. Uh, what is going on on the roots here? And since we don't have much time, I will go fairly quickly to the answer. Anybody remember this? This was nitrogen fixing nodules on veg. So not everything strange you see the soil is actually detrimental. These were, of course, part of the, um, the symbiosis going on there on this particular legume. Although the legume, in fact, was a weed in this situation. So that's another, another layer to it. Uh, how about this one here? This is from several years ago now, a raspberry planting at a home in Buncombe County. And you can see the chlorosis here, the yellowing intervenal chlorosis, and also sort of a witch's broom going on there with the, with the new growth. This was uh, an April 
photograph. Let's see if I can bring the chat up. Okay, no takers on that. Well, this was at least diagnosed by the people who know such things at the time. Uh, it was at the time was diagnosed by those who know such things, I should say it that way, as suspected glyphosate injury. So here's an example of, uh, back in those days, it may not have been one of those uh, combination products. It may have been just regular old glyphosate. And you can see how clear the edge of this bed is of weeds. So that application, I don't know, is Joe? Yes, Joe is still on. So I don't know if he wants to chime in here, but this would have been an application that the, was made the previous season and uh, absorbed the product absorbed by the plant and uh, stored over the winter and then affected the, the new growth. And yeah, I, just just to interject there it could be just root up take from you can see along the edge of the bed how you know the the brambles you know or cane berries you know the roots will spread and then produce adventitious shoots coming up from from root segments and but it's all connected so if you spray some of those with glyphosate you can get translocation back into the uh uh the bushes and you can get absorption through the bark in cane berries. So if you get glyphosate sprays on the bark, uh, even in the winter time, you can get uh, damage to the uh, to the brambles. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, I hadn't thought about root uptake in the current season being a possibility here. I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're on. And I had. Um... I have put this slide in, not even taking into consideration that you were going to be talking about this. But it was a nice coincidence. However, I haven't said anything about actual diseases, and uh, that's my area. So really quickly, some things to be on the lookout for during the month of April. Of course, the dogwoods, at least in our part of the state, are starting to produce their showy bracts and their, their little flowers. And depending on what kind of weather conditions we have, we may see uh, very little to none to much spot anthracnose, not to be confused with dogwood anthracnose. So this will affect the bracts and also cause some leaf spots. Maybe you can kind of see one there that could be uh, the dog, I'm sorry, the spot anthracnose, but it's not like the dogwood anthracnose, which can actually get in and cause cankers. So this is a basically a cosmetic problem. Um, and the whole idea of there's uh, something in a name, Gymnosporangium juniperi virginiani is our cedar apple rust, referring to its uh, alternation of hosts between the juniper and uh, uh, where juniper is virginiana as the, as the alternate host, but you're going to be seeing it as these tendrils, the telial horns starting to come out in our first warm rains and uh, eventually developing these large gelatinous structures that produce the spores that will blow over and infect our apples and crab apples. Any time of year, we've got to be aware of the possibility of Phytophthora and armillaria root rots killing our trees and shrubs and Phytophthora in landscape plants too. We just had a sample come in recently of Phytophthora crown rot and some pansies in a, in a commercial site, a, a golf uh, country club type setting. Um, Exhibicidium leaf gall and camellia. These whitish, uh, eventually they get a whitish coat on them, but at first all you see is the thick waxy leaves coming out. I looked at uh, the Sasanquas that we had it on last year. Just checked them yesterday. I didn't see anything real quickly, but now is the time to be scouting for that and pick them off immediately before they have a chance to produce spores. And then they overwinter in the buds and, and produce this symptom on the new growth the following spring. Unfortunately, we will, um, and you probably already have been seeing rose rosette symptoms. This is a shrub that was uh, submitted or the photos were submitted a couple of years ago. And it's a very advanced case where you've got the witch's broom, you've got the reddening of the foliage. Uh, back to the whole glyphosate idea, that can cause some witch's brooms, but they would not be red like this. They would be uh, green in color. The red retention of that red juvenile color, even if you don't have the witch's broom, is a red flag, excuse the pun, that you may have rose rosette. Shot hole on cherry laurel, and many different things on prunus can cause this. It is not insect feeding in this case. It is an infection that occurred, 
and the plant walled off that infection, the necrotic spot dropped out, leaving the ragged shot hole effect. On fruits, there won't be too much happening just yet. We could have some of the blossom and twig phase of brown rot in peach, which will later be on the fruit as it is maturing. Pleach leaf curl is something that you might see as well on the foliage coming out. And you may even see some fire blight on pear being more susceptible than apple. We won't see it on the apples uh, until probably next month. I'm sorry, uh, the month of May. That's when we really start to get those in. But uh, pear being quite susceptible, that's something to be on the lookout for. And also, of course, uh, make sure that you're, if you're growing tree fruits, to make sure that your spray program is in place for diseases and insects. Really quickly in the flower bed, rust on oxalis or on hollyhock, you can see on the underside of this leaf here, volutella blight of pachysandra, and daylily leaf streak, typically a narrow band down the midrib is how you see this manifested. And that's a good clue that you've got daylily leaf streak. And you can also see some of the leaf miner trails in this photograph as well. And turf grasses, just two real quick points that uh, as spring is coming on, we may start to see fairy rings in any kind of turf. And notice in this particular case, they are green rings. This is not a fungus that infects the living plants, but is uh, decaying the thatch. And because of the way that it affects moisture, at least my understanding of how this works, it can actually cause the turf to die out. But once that old thatch has broken down, it releases nutrients and you get the green ring. And later on, you may get some mushrooms or some puffballs popping up in portions of these rings or arcs. Spring dead spot is another thing that we'll start to see in the warm season grasses, Bermuda and Zoysia, as they start to green up. And what happened was there was an infection back in the fall that occurred, a fungus that caused these plants to be susceptible to winter kill. And so the spots show up when the grass resumes growth in the spring. As always, if this was not enough bolos to sate your appetite, you can go to our website and click on the bolos tab in the menu item on the left. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mike and Matt. Uh, we are packing it in today with full of good information for springtime. And now I will finish it out for us with our Master Gardener program announcement. Let me get it to be full screen here. Okay. So first, uh, we are going to continue to tell you about our upcoming EMG College, which will take place on September 24th through the 26th this year here in Raleigh on the Centennial Campus of NC State at the Hunt Library. We've got our Go link is there at the bottom of the slide where we'll continue to update information about the EMG College. So um, mark your calendar. We hope you can join us. The program is starting to be developed and we look forward to sharing more details with, it, with you on that uh, next month. Okay, we have some great um, continuing education webinars coming up for you. Our next Learn, Grow, Share Showcase will be on Thursday, April 11th at two in the afternoon. And this is going to be an opportunity to hear from EMG volunteers and extension professionals uh, about the events that they held last year during the Great Southeast Pollinator Census. And we have counties um, joining us to share projects. We're gonna hear from Lee County, Harnett, Onslow and Surrey counties. So join us and uh, listen to how they um, planned events surrounding the Great Southeast Pollinator Census, which is something else to mark your calendar for. It's coming up this summer. It will be August 23rd and 24th. This is a statewide opportunity, statewide volunteer opportunity for you to be involved in um, citizen science and counting and observing pollinators at a given time on those days. It's a fun event to do as a group um, and to get the public involved in as well. And we've heard a lot about this today, but the upcoming online classes that Laura teaches, a couple um, are starting soon, including plant propagation 
and annuals, perennials, vines, and ground covers. So in the follow-up resources today, you'll have a lot of different links, making sure you find out about all the online classes, how to register for them, the discount that Extension Master Gardener volunteers qualify for, and frequently asked questions about those courses. There's another lecture that's coming up the end of this week. Yes, the end of this week. Um, and this is a, a lecture on horticultural therapy and an update on current research. We have a guest that's coming to the campus, Dr. Sangami Lee, and she'll share her current research on horticultural therapy. And this is an, um, actually, um, you can attend either in person here in Raleigh at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum, or you can watch it via Zoom. Either way, you're going to want to register on Eventbrite using the link that will be provided. And that, once you register on Eventbrite, you will receive the link for the Zoom lecture if you choose to attend that way. Okay, and as Charlotte alluded to, um, Dr. Joe Neal, who we heard from today, has been kind enough to schedule with us a webinar coming up in July that's going to focus exclusively on landscape weed ID and management. So here we're going to hear about the principles of weed identification, including using apps and books. Um, he'll talk about weed biology, how they grow and spread, and the strategies and the tools that we need for managing weeds in landscape settings. Um, so this will be an emphasis on weeds that are common to North Carolina and the, the weed control that's available to consumers, as he spoke about today. So that uh, webinar is already on the EMG internet calendar. You can go ahead and register for that. And that will be a good thing to do on a hot July afternoon. That brings us to the conclusion of the March Plants, Pests, and Pathogens. And gets us able to look ahead at April. So coming up next month on April 23rd, this will be a focus on hydrangeas and crepe myrtles. So Matt and Mike will be preparing pests and diseases common to hydrangeas and crepe myrtles. So this should be excellent and very useful to us. Um, you can learn about that and all the previous plant pests and pathogens webinars here at the Go link. Uh, where you can find recordings and the index. So we thank all of our guests today and everyone for presenting, and we wish you happy spring, everybody. We'll see you next month on April 23rd.